Can everyone hear me? Sounds like it. Good. So my name is Mark Wilde. I'm another USC homeboy playing on the home turf here. Member of uh, Sequist. Sequist kind of, there was an old TV show called Sequest. It was a really bad TV show, but Sequest is not that. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about two papers. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this first one a little more, how to do quantum convolutional coding with entanglement assisted, and this is work with Todd Brun. And at the very end, I'm going to talk about entanglement distillation protocols, convolutional protocols for entanglement distillation. And this is work with Harry Crovey, former USC student now at NSC Labs, and also Todd Brun. So first, we're going to talk about a classical convolutional code and why you would want to use this. Uh, this technique is very popular in cell phones, wireless communications. Also, a uh, group at JPL is very famous for using this technique, communication with satellites. And so we'd like to take this and apply it to the quantum domain. There are several papers out there, out there which already use this technique, but we've extended it to use entanglement assistance, where the sender and receiver share entanglement. And the most popular technique for decoding convolutional codes also came from another USC homeboy, Viterbi, who gave uh, our school as the Viterbi School of Engineering. Now, a classical convolutional code, this could be a circuit that would take an input stream of data to an output stream. And actually, they usually take uh, one set of inputs to several sets of outputs. And this particular circuit is a finite impulse response circuit. What this means is if your input stream is of finite duration, then what comes out will also be of finite duration. You can see that this will happen. Each of these, so these little dots are copying elements, and these D gates are delay gates. So you, what you do is a linear time invariant filter of your input stream to generate the output stream. Now, if you just have finite duration or finite impulse response circuits, that limits your power of what you can do in the classical domain. So there are also infinite impulse response circuits. And it's assumed in these models that errors will not occur when you're encoding data. And that, that's an assumption that we will make uh, in some of our codes. So that's why I stress that now. An infinite impulse response circuit, a finite duration input stream can lead to an infinite duration output stream. That's why uh, this, is, this filter corresponding to it is called the infinite impulse response filter. And that happens because you're taking the inputs and you are copying them and putting them back into the circuit. And so we use in our circuits, uh, in some of our circuits, infinite impulse response quantum circuits and uh, we'll discuss some of the issues involved with these circuits later on. So now, just to review, a quantum stabilizer code, a quantum block code, operates in the following way. The, the, the perspective we're taking in this talk is a communications perspective, not necessarily a quantum computing, where we're talking about quantum convolutional codes. But they can be used for quantum computing. So anyway, uh, you start, Alice starts out with some information qubits and some redundant qubits she performs and encoding sends these qubits one at a time over a noisy channel. Bob then performs measurements to diagnose the errors and learns syndromes from the results of these measures, measurements and performs recovery operations. This is the standard model of quantum error correction we're used to. Now a quantum com oh now let me talk about what an entanglement assisted code, how it operates. Todd talked about this in detail in his earlier talk. But we'll just review it here. Alice begins with some set of information qubits, some ancillas, and ebits shared between her and Bob. She then performs a local encoding unitary on her qubits, sends them over the noisy channel. In this process, it's assumed that Bob's half of the ebits don't undergo noise. This is the same assumption used in the proof of entanglement assisted capacity theorems, and we make this assumption uh, when doing entanglement assisted coding. It turns out there are some codes that can correct for errors on Bob's side, but it's not true in general that all entanglement assisted codes can correct for errors on Bob's side. So we make this assumption in the operation of these codes. 
So then Alice sends her qubits over the noisy channel. Bob receives all the qubits, combines them, performs measurements to diagnose the errors, and then performs recovery operations based on those syndromes that he detects from the measurements. Now the big crucial result that came from this work is that you could import an arbitrary classical block code for use in quantum error correction. With the previous picture with stabilizer codes, the CSS construction, you could only import dual containing codes. This allows you to import the full power of the classical coding theory. So this is what we were looking for with the convolutional theory. Now, quickly, a quantum convolutional code, uh, several people that have worked on, that have established this area, Olivia Tillich and Forney and Marcus Grassl and Martin Rettler have worked on this, these codes. How these operate is you divide a qubit stream into uh, frames. And in each frame, you have a set of information qubits and ancilla qubits. And then you perform, Alice performs encoding unitaries that can overlap some of these frames. And so this overlapping unitary gives the code a memory structure. The usefulness of having this convolutional structure is that you can use the same devices, such as a linear optical circuit, or, or that's what we would be looking for, but you can use the same physical devices or the same physical routines to encode these codes. And then Alice sends uh, her qubits. After some of them have been decoded, she can send them in an online fashion as they're being encoded online over a noisy channel. And Bob receives them, performs overlapping measurements and he needs to perform a decoding algorithm, such as the Viterbi algorithm, to diagnose errors that occur. Now, this, all you're doing with this algorithm is you're feeding the syndromes that result from the measurements into the algorithm. It's a purely classical process when you're processing with the Viterbi algorithm. You diagnose which errors occur, which are the most likely to occur, and Bob performs recovery operations based on these uh, syndrome measurements and what the Viterbi algorithm outputs. And then he finally decodes the encoded qubit stream so that the information qubits appear at the receiving end of the channel. And ideally, they're noise free. So that's the way a convolutional code operates. Now what we've done is we've given the convolutional structure the added benefit of entanglement assistance, where center receivers share EBITs beforehand in each frame. So what this picture is telling you, the red qubits are Alice's, and the blues are Bob's half of the EBITs. Okay. So since they're spatially separated, Alice's encoding operations can only be on her qubits. And that's why we have this little loop jumping over the circuit, because Bob's half of the EBIT doesn't go into it. And you perform the same overlapping encoding structure. Alice sends her half of the qubits over the noisy channel to get affected by noise. Bob's, the blue ones, are immune to the noise from the entanglement assisted assumption. And Bob finally then takes all of the qubits in each frame and performs uh, overlapping measurements, stabilizer measurements to diagnose the errors. And these codes have a stabilizer structure, uh, which we won't really get into that much into, in this talk. And then finally, after Bob has performed recovery operations, he just needs to perform them on the red qubits, Alice's qubits. After doing that, he takes all of the qubits and t can decode. Okay, now with some of our codes, the information qubits won't appear in their original spots. So as an example, if I had an information qubit down here, it could appear as the second one in each, or the third one in each frame at the receiving end. So this is some sort of coherent teleportation that's occurring in this process.